selling a little or a lot, Shopify helps you do your thing however you cha-ching. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. From the launch your online shop stage to the first real life store stage, all the way to do we just hit a million orders stage? Shopify's there to help you grow. Whether you're selling scented soap or offering outdoor outfits, Shopify helps you sell everywhere. From their all-in-one e-commerce platform to their in-person POS system, wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. Shopify helps you turn browsers into buyers with the internet's best converting checkout. 36% better on average compared to other leading commerce platforms. And sell more with less effort thanks to Shopify Magic, your AI-powered all-star. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the U.S. And Shopify's the global force behind Allbirds, Rothy's, and Brooklinen, and millions of other entrepreneurs of every size across 175 countries. Plus, Shopify's award-winning help is there to support your success every step of the way. Because businesses that grow, grow with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash audioboom, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash audioboom now to grow your business no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash audioboom. Hi, I'm Wendy, and this is an interview that has an interesting twist. I'll put the footnote at the end of our conversation. Here's Irma. I was in my 20s by the time I would accept the fact or realize that these were people who were deceased because I was seeing spirits all the time. But I never equated them with someone who had died because I didn't know anybody who had died. Irma Slage, the last time I spoke with you you a few days ago, we were talking about about having this conversation. You said we've known each other for what? How long? 21 years. I was like, oh, my gosh. I mean, I knew we'd been around the block a time or two, but that's (laughs) that's a history. (laughs) That's a history. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. And in the meantime, um, you've continued to do what you do. And for anyone who has not had a chance to read your books or uh, connect with you on Facebook or anywhere else, you're a medium and you're a psychic and you're an intuitive. And the first book you did, Automatic Writing, and those are available if you're doing the Google search on Amazon, Phases of Life After Death, written in automatic writing. And then the second book, you took a trip and were able to see and connect with ghosts in England. So it's called The Ghostly Guide to England with spirits that you encountered. And, you know, the the thing that always impressed me was from the first time I connected with you, seeing the orb and having you walk with a TV crew through the house and saying, this is where they are. And then later, later, they showed up on film. That was absolutely a slam dunk touchdown in terms of someone who connects with other spirits, elementals, whatever they are in whatever case, and able to document and show proof of that connection. So that was, I was just like, okay, here you go. This is legit. And thank you. Oh, oh well, it's my pleasure to, uh, to be able to do this. I mean, I've been doing it so long that it would be, uh, I'd be a different person if I wasn't able to do what I can do. Seeing orbs and seeing spirits around my house and around other places and being able to connect with them and help them move on if they need it. Like in the collar mine in Virginia city, I went there and I knew before we began our tour, which is a a story in itself, how I got to go on that tour. It was just my husband and myself and the docent. And we're going through this collar mine. And I knew in advance that I was going to, have to um, or have the ability to get have these spirits go on because that mine is awful they the equipment they used was called the widow because it made all of their wives widows just from them using it so I put that on my Facebook page it shows a face in one of the orbs when you look at it it's amazing because there isn't any sign of almost a spot where there isn't an orb. That's how many people died in that horrible place. They used to have no light, no means of, oh, if you were claustrophobic, you could not go in there. So even though a soul is not here in the physical form, they're still very much around us. 
sometimes they need help to move on. The orb on that one is in your on your Facebook page. Yes. The other one that I put on are two pictures that were taken by my husband two minutes apart. They're both in a woman's living room. One was with all the orbs that are in the room, and the room itself looks cloudy. That was the thing that surprised me when I saw both these pictures. After I cleared them less than two minutes later, there are no orbs anymore, and the picture is completely clear. And that's what surprised me, because I can see how unclear a room is when there's a lot of orbs. That's what I like about it, is it's so obvious. I think people are looking for when they're wanting orb photos is a before and after, so you can see some kind of a trans a transition, and it just helps fill in the blanks. It does, and it, it, it's the same as when someone has the cameras in their house that pick up orbs where those there's nobody there. There isn't a person walking around taking a picture. Pets pick up these things, and they get scared, and they stare. And then if you would take a picture, you would find an orb right next to your pet. I had somebody show me one of those kind of a a video. And the video shows this little, um, it would be like the size of a fly. So it's a little white speck flying around and going from hither, thither, and yon. And he was trying to figure out, you know, what it was. It wasn't an insect, and he knew that. But he couldn't figure out what the purpose would be. And so I asked did you have an animal? Because this seems to me to be an animal. And he says, well, no, I can't think of, you know, not recently. And, and then he called back later and said, um, I forgot because the pet that had been in that room and by the chair in the location that, <laughs> that this orb is acting about, yeah, there was a cat and the cat was in that room, but it hadn't been recently. So he forgot about it because it had been that much time, but the pet was still there. Absolutely. We're all energy and When we die, energy separates us from our body, but it still stays energy. And so it can come up as orbs and pictures. Our loved ones, including our pets, never leave us anyway. And so it just comes up in pictures. It's perfect. There was a a picture also on my Facebook page I put on. We were taking a family portrait. It was Thanksgiving. A family member who had recently died wanted to be part of this picture. And where did he decide to become part of this picture as an orb? Is right on my face, right in the middle. And I remember thinking, oh, now, now the, the picture is ruined. We're going to have to take it again. We did take it again, and he was just a little bit off my face. But this one that I blew up that's on the Facebook has it perfectly front and center on my face. And he was part of the group. That's incredible. It was actually annoying at the time and then funny later. Yeah. I know. Yeah. You ruined the photo. (laughs) Thank you so much. But, you know, that's what friends are for. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. And, and, And no matter where we went taking pictures, he was there the whole time because he was in all of the pictures. So he meant a lot. To be there. How and recently had he been deceased? A very short amount of time, maybe a couple weeks. Okay, so he was still very much a part of the activities. He was. He wanted to be part of the activities as he was before. You know. So he was there. But he didn't miss a thing. When you were a kid, how were you first able to deal with some of these people you were seeing weren't physical? It was an amazing thing. I was in my 20s by the time I would accept the fact or realize that these were people who were deceased because I was seeing spirits all the time, but I never equated them with someone who had died because I didn't know anybody who had died. But then a neighbor of mine died, and I'm looking at her, and she's in my bedroom. You can't dispute it. There she is. I saw her plain as day. And I didn't know that she had died yet. <laughs> Which mm. is, she told me to call her house. I called her house and her husband told me she had died. What? So did you tell him, no, she's right here? Or did you keep that quiet? Actually, I said to him, you know, cut the, cut the uh, comedy here. I know she's there. Just put her on the phone. 
That's what I thought. Mm-hmm. Because I still couldn't get it through my head that I was talking to someone who had died. And boy, when it got through my head, my life was not the same. Everything had changed. My thinking had changed. I was more open to what was being said as wow. I remember looking out the window and seeing the snow on the ground. I lived back east then and thinking, well, everything looked the same, but it's not the same inside me. And that's how it began. I just found out that she had died, and I didn't know it. I I don't know what I thought. I think I was too young to think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was like, okay, this is different. Now what? <laughs> like, And then my mother died, and after that, wow, everything took off. She was right there by my side, and she was giving me a whole lot of information, and she was um, my right hand, really. Did she appear she physical if, when you were looking at her, or more of a telepathic? Oh, no, no, no. Physical. Absolutely physical. I did not know she died. She died suddenly of a heart attack. And I'm sitting there on my sofa in my, my den, and I'm looking up, and I see this really young, pretty, nice, peaceful lady. And she said to, my, to me, oh, I like your sofa. You know, I just got a new sofa that morning. <laughs> and I said, thank you. And I said, you know, who, who are you? And she, and then she looked sad. She was so bright and cheerful and the, the energy from her, it was beautiful. But when I said to her, who are you? She said, I don't have the heart to tell you. When you get the call, you'll know. Wow. She didn't have the heart to, you know. After that, I saw her all the time. She looked the same, that young, vibrant. Young, vibrant, pretty, smiling. Oh, it was. Wonderful to see her that way. It, it, it was um, still hard. You know, you would think it would be easy, and it was easier, but it's still hard when you lose someone. Yeah. When my grandmother died, um, there were about maybe three, two or three days that I, I, my gut just, you know, upside down, turmoil, pain. And she, when she came to me, it was an immediate and then I get things in color, but it, it was like pink and everything lightened up and I, the, the, the grief was gone. She took it away, but it was that, that there was such a dramatic change and I knew, okay, it's all right. And she talked to me about things that like a song she wanted at her funeral and um, told me things I had no idea happened in her life. And I was, it was confirmed by other people, but it was just so amazing that immediate relief of no longer feeling that intense, intense grief. And there's, there are other things that happen when we experience a, a death of a, a loved one, somebody who's close to us, but you have a unique ability to see them still in, in a physical form. And, and that, I think it, it gives you a whole lot more assurance that we live beyond the physical. And are you able to see their dimension of what else they see? I see myself uh, without them helping me where they are and what they're doing. For instance, when I, uh, my, when my cat, he was in a cat hospital. And I remember going over there to see if he was okay. <laughs> and I could see the surroundings and they put him in a little container and I guess they help him sleep because he was sleeping. And it was, it was really nice. Um, he was taken care of. After he died, I went to see him, and there he was. It was the most beautiful grass and sky, and it was so pretty. And I remember thinking, this is the best. How, how, could, how could you do anything else but want this cat to have this happiness and comfort? And so, yeah, that does help a lot to see them not only where they are and what they're doing firsthand and personal, but also know that they're okay. That does help, you know, in every way to know that they're okay. When a medium as working as a medium and somebody comes to your house, has their person already come ahead of time and say, Hey, so-and-so is coming in, please, you know, let, let them know I'm here. Do, do you get that kind of a pre-meeting or, you know, any kind of a warning? Oh, absolutely. I have people talking to my, in my head and telling me what they want to do and what they want to say and, 
and the excitement of having this opportunity to talk to someone who they left behind because not everybody can hear what they're saying. So the, the opportunity is there for the amount of moments that they're with me. The opportunity is there for them to get a message and that message helps them. What has been in, like your mom said, she didn't want to tell you because that was going to be too painful. What are difficult messages to interpret or give someone from their recently deceased person? Has it been complicated sometimes? Well, when I work with, um, say, people who have had uh, murders, that's a tough one for their loved ones to tell them about that and sometimes they won't sometimes they'll you know skirt around it a little bit so as not to hurt them uh if someone's not quite all there when they're alive you know alzheimer's is a big thing their relatives worry will he be able to find me and i assure them that it's not the same when you're on the other side, of course they can find you. So when you put all that together, the basic rule of thumb is the people are there, just as you said, to give us comfort. And that's how I see it. Whatever that comfort may mean to them. Now, when you wrote your book, Phases of Life After Death, and you wrote it in automatic writing, what phases do we go through? We go through phases after we die somewhat the same as in life. So let's say we count being birthed as the first phase, then death would be the first phase. The people that we see when we're, uh, after we're born, uh, the nurses, the feeling in the area, everything about that could be a second, a second uh, step. And so in death, it would be the people that you meet on the other side. Also, they take you to a room to help you with pain. It has all sorts of colors and through light because we're energy. So the light comes in us and it helps us with pain and, and how people deal with different things when they're on earth. It helps them with that too because we leave behind. You like to think you straighten everything out when you go, but you really don't. There's a lot of loose ends, things you wish you could continue to do, of course. And this helps you, the light helps you uh, understand. I, it's almost like an orb in different colors. It goes through you and it just helps settle things down because we're, we are energy. What do you want people to know? because of your connections and your interactions and what you've learned after, what, 30 years of doing this to help give people an idea that that this reality is something that each of us will, in some way, shape, or form, become very familiar with when we transition. What, What would maybe the most important thing to know? That love never dies. You never really leave anyone. People on the other side don't miss us because they're with us all the time. We just don't know it. That's the main thing, that love never dies. It continues, and we're always together. So what are they doing over there? They're helping other people. I'm helping people on this side. I assume I'll continue on the other side. And that's what they're doing. They're helping people. My mother told me that she became a person who helped a little girl who was just born. She became her, they call them angels here, um, the person who gives them information through their mind. She became that person to that girl until she became a certain age. And so we're constantly helping people on this side. We're helping ourselves on the other side. That's our main goal is to help other people. In all the years that I've been doing this, there's three things that we're supposed to accomplish while we're on earth. And the first one is to be good to ourselves. And the second one is to be good to others. And the third one is to be happy. It sounds so simple. It's not. (laughs) (laughs) Obviously. Obviously. (laughs) Our headlines are kind of proof of that. 
Um, we make it complicated. I our headline. <laughs> it's complicated. It's not easy. It's 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 um, it's uh, it's a goal, and goals are never made. Sometimes, when you talk to people, do you find out about reincarnation information, or is it just related to the recent deceased lifetime? Mostly they're worried about the people they leave behind because they're so concerned about them. A man came to see me about his grandfather who had died, and he felt bad that he couldn't be with them when he died. It was very sudden. And I said to him, well, I've been trying to figure out how not to hurt my loved ones when I die, and I can't figure it out. I said I could invite everybody that I love, who loves me, into my house and blow it up, and we'd all die at the same time. But then how about the people who love them? You see, people think somehow we have power, and we don't. If only I was with him, he wouldn't have died. I could have saved him. And that's one of the stages of death um, that us humans go through is the guilt. Mm -hmm. And that's what he was going through. And I told him, there's no way to do it. We're going to, if we love, we're going to hurt someone when we die. And the best we can do is let them know that we're still there. With different pets, I've had information. With one pet, the spirit guides told me to stop calling for him. Because every time, I was very, very deep in grief with this with this cat. I, we were super connected. He was in my dreams, daytime, nighttime, he was with me. And then when he crossed over, um, he came back at one specific time to help me basically get over my grief. But the spirit guides prior to that, it said, you have to stop because every time you do this, it's like a phone call. The phone keeps ringing and he doesn't have time to answer. Okay. He's got stuff to do. He can't keep answering the phone. So, but that was one of them. The other one, when my, when my, another cat died, the cat told me, you have to leave. I cannot do this while you're here. It was just, that was heartbreaking to hear knowing that I was, I was so connected that he couldn't make the jump, which is what he had to do. He had to, he was, he was leaving. I did give him space to do that, but getting those kinds of bits of information, I didn't have as a kid, I didn't know any of this. And then growing into it and being able to make those connections, it's been very helpful to understand that sometimes when someone is going to die, they stay as long as they possibly can to help others not have to hurt so much. And they don't do it necessarily from this conscious form here, but from the spirit form, knowing I'm going to make this transition, but I'm going to make this transition as easy as I can. And certainly I know that some of my pets have done that for me. Have you experienced that? I experienced it with my mother. <laughs> mm -hmm. One day she said, yeah, I know it's fun. It's funny because, I was always talking to her, and she said, you know, don't call me. I have a lot to do here. <laughs> <laughs> we want to hold on. We want to hang on. Wait a minute. I'm the most important thing here, right? Yeah. But, yeah. no, my my mother did come, and she said, D you know, don't don't um, call me. I'll, I'll come when I can. <laughs> don't yeah. call me. I'll call you. <laughs> I know. It's so true. It's funny. But, yeah. That was with my mom. She's the only one that I remember specifically coming to tell me, don't call me anymore. It's different, though. It's different because that's like my cats, very, very, very close. And so, you know, that bond, you want it to be there. It, it's difficult to break it. And so, like with your mom, that same, that's the bond. It's like, okay, well, here, you're, you're mine. You're mine. And she's saying, well, maybe not quite that much. <laughs> yeah. Well, absolutely. It's absolutely true. And you, and you got to give them space. Uh, because they have things that they have to do too. Even while they were on earth, how about if you wanted them to come to your house and stay there for the whole day or something every day, you know, it just wouldn't work. Mm -hmm. They have to live their own life. When you went to Europe, you said that they, you were looking forward to, because there were so many ghosts. What were the ones that stood out? I saw a lot of crypts and we went down basements a lot. They had underneath. The one that, stands out. I was in Buckingham Palace and Queen Elizabeth's father was talking to me. And I didn't know anything about Queen Elizabeth's 
father at the time. Of course, after that, I checked it out. But he died very early. It was unfortunate. It was cancer. He was telling me how he stays near his daughter all the time to try to help her. And I, I think that was one of the nicest ones. I always liked authors, so I liked going to authors' homes, too. So who did you see? Charles, the one who um, wrote all those ghost books. I like him. Charles Dickens? Charles Dickens, yeah. Did he make an appearance? He did. He followed me around. I, I touched his desk that he used to work at. And the only place I ever felt comfortable in England where someone wasn't following me and talking to me through my mind was a little place that they had made into a, a little deli, a little coffee shop, and it went into his backyard. So they added on to it. So I was, def- I was sitting in his backyard, so there was actually nobody there because it was nice and quiet. <laughs> the bedrooms weren't. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry I find that funny, but, but yeah, <laughs> okay. Uh, so who did you meet in the there bedrooms? Very, oh, boy. Um, you know, their bedrooms were packed with people. They they put a lot of people in a small amount of space. So, yeah, there, he had kids and he had a wife and, you know, he had his, his life there. And so those people are still there, too. But not all the time. They're there because they know I'm coming and they want to talk and tell their story and they know they can. I know that sounds weird in a way. They don't want to stay there. People, I don't think people want to stay there unless they're dramatized. Like the, uh, the mine in Virginia City, Nevada, that, they were dramatized. Well, horrific experiences and then not having a way out. Exactly. A belief in the afterlife, does that help make the transition easier? No, it doesn't. Um, What I found is that living your life in a kind way helps you move on easier. We all make mistakes, and if you're sorry for them or if you understand that you wish you could have done them in a different way, that's what makes transition easier. Having less baggage. Yeah, that's about it. Understanding that you're not perfect, you wish you were, and you would have done it differently had you known, but it didn't work that way. So, you know, we all have regrets. Yeah. And, and, and if you understand that part of it, you transition a lot easier. The one time I actually had to do something that could have caused me some extreme karmic issues, I was stopped. And the spirit guide beside me before I, I did this action said, karma. And before that, I wasn't really familiar with karma. <laughs> and, you know, people say there's no such thing as karma. That's just, eh. And, but the spirit guide beside me when that, in that tone said karma, I, there's something to this and I'm not going there. Yeah, I'm very, very careful of what I say and do. Yeah. Because we sure do know karma. And especially from a, a medium, you know, taking responsibility for someone who is trusting you to work on their behalf in their best interest for the highest good, then that is a, is a responsibility. And, and you take that seriously because of, to me, making mistakes at that level is more than just the level here of stupidity. That's intentional. And there's a lot more baggage I'll say that goes with that. Absolutely. I do absolutely take it with a big deal of responsibility And people have come and said, I'm coming to you because another psychic told me blah, 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 blah. Is it true? And sometimes they tell them, your your husband's going to die in five years or, you know, something cruel. I think that's cruel to tell somebody that. Do you really want to pass that on? Is it really important for them to know? Now, if I got the message that he's going to be ill... I, you know, I would definitely put it in a different way than that. Um, but thankfully, I don't get that. So, yeah, the person has to take responsibility when they say it. If you go to a medium and they tell you that there's all these horrible, um, bad 
people around you and they're out to do you harm or give me a million dollars and I'll take care of it. That's scary. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. And unath- mostly unethical. <laughs> it's, it's just like, well, that. it is. And I've had people call me and we talk about it and I'm saying, no, there's nobody there and you're fine. And you know, they really believe it because, if something goes wrong in their life, then all of a sudden they blame it on that instead of blaming it on life. In different parts of the world, there there are uh, rituals and very negative practices that when people get caught up in that, it can, it can be scary. I had one guy ask me, you know, do you believe in curses? It doesn't matter if I believe in them. If somebody is experiencing that and has been told they are cursed, then that person believes in it. That's a whole different ball of wax. Because when you get into that system of belief, there's a lot of power there that has been ingrained for centuries, not just because of the you know most recent scary books, but because of practices. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And if you have no one to tell you, say, that you can trust, that it's not real and it's not, and they, they do it and they say, oh, your first baby is fine, but your second baby is going to be cursed. Do you know I have seen it and I had to say now let me look into this and reassure them that it's not true they just wanted your money or whatever psychic medium Irma Slage she has some excellent orb photos on her Facebook page you can check that out a short break selling a little or a lot (laughs) Shopify helps you do your thing however you cha-ching Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. From the launch your online shop stage to the first real life store stage, all the way to do we just hit a million orders stage? Shopify is there to help you grow. Whether you're selling scented soap or offering outdoor outfits, Shopify helps you sell everywhere. From their all-in-one e-commerce platform to their in-person POS system, wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. Shopify helps you turn browsers into buyers with the internet's best converting checkout. 36% better on average compared to other leading commerce platforms. And sell more with less effort thanks to Shopify Magic, your AI-powered all-star. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the U.S. And Shopify is the global force behind Allbirds, Rothy's, and Brooklinen, and millions of other entrepreneurs of every size across 175 countries. Plus, Shopify's award-winning help is there to support your success every step of the way. Because businesses that grow, grow with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash audioboom, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash audioboom now to grow your business no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash audioboom. This podcast is sponsored by Ramp. Are you the decision maker in your company? Consider this. For the first time in decades, there's a better option for a corporate card and spend management platform. Meet Ramp, the only corporate card and spend management system designed to help you spend less money so you can make more. Most corporate credit cards offer points as incentives, but those points amount to less than their worth in real cash value. Ramp's corporate cards offer you cash back, real money in your pocket. Plus, you control who spends what with each vendor. And Ramp's software collects and verifies receipts automatically, which means you'll stop wasteful spending and close your books in hours instead of days. Businesses that use Ramp add up to 5% to their bottom line the first year. If you're a decision maker, adding Ramp could be one of the best decisions you've ever made. And now get $250 when you join Ramp. Just go to ramp.com slash easy. Ramp.com slash easy. R-A-M-P dot com slash easy. Currents issued by Sutton Bank and Celtic Bank members of DIC terms and conditions apply. Again, one of the things that impressed me at the very beginning, like what, 20 years ago, I saw a presentation when she was accompanied by a news crew, a TV news crew. And she said there was an orb, some, someone on the bed. And later, they went back and checked it, and sure enough, there was the orb. So the ability to see those orbs was impressive. And she has recent photos posted on her Facebook page, Irma Slage, I-R-M-A-S-L-A-G-E, on Facebook. When you're working with a medium, the medium is working on your behalf. And so for anyone trying to make a decision about who to see, 
then get some references. And you've been doing this for 30 years. So this isn't like their first trip around the block. And the more experience you have, I think the better equipped you are to deal with different kinds of complicated issues, not just a, a crossing over, but uh, where, where the scenario has been less pleasant. I can see the difference in me now than I could years and years and years ago because of the experience of meeting people and understanding you know, I was trying to make things quieter for people, and I decided that, no, if they don't understand what I'm saying, I have to say it in a different way, and I do that all the time. Because people, it's up to the person to realize what I'm saying, because I'm saying just words that I hear in my head. But they're getting emotions and thoughts. I'm getting emotions and thoughts. But they understand these emotions and thoughts in a different way than I will because they know the person that I'm talking to. Yeah. One time I got the phrase, pick yourself up by your bootstraps. That is not a phrase I say, but that was a phrase that was given. She said that my dad said that all the time. Yes, exactly. You wouldn't know that that's it. And that happens to me a lot. If someone loses a person, I will do automatic writing and I will send them the letter. One time I sent the letter to this lady and I said, take care, pal. And he signed his name. I didn't know he called her pal, (laughs) his wife. I didn't know. Mm -hmm. Okay, pal. So, yeah, I, I wouldn't know that and it wouldn't mean anything to me. But to her, it meant, like you said, a great deal. I think that as an intuitive, people need to know this. People who are genuinely intuitive and not real informed about how that might work, that when you get these phrases that surprise you and that come out of the blue and they have nothing to do the way you normally speak or the normal language that you use, that's a clue, a huge clue. And skeptics will say, well, you went on Google and researched. How the heck could you have gotten pal with a Google research? That doesn't work that way. No, there's no way. There's just no way. And, and, and sometimes they, they will, the other side will give you information. For instance, this man was, uh, was killed and he gave the information to his wife who was, who was sitting in my living room with the stipulation that she does nothing with it because the people are still around and they'll come in and hurt her. Mm-hmm. And, and so she has to listen to that. That's very important. You get so much information that you just don't understand at the time, but you have to go with it. That part I've been through before, and the information was that you have to let it go. And not only that, it's because the person living has something to lose. The person who is deceased <gasps> is now out of the picture. But the person living who goes after it, whether it's a vendetta or justice or however you want to call it, that person has so much more to lose, not only getting involved with that element, but then the psyche, the the mindset of having to live with that trauma that will ensue from carrying that debt forward instead of saying, this is This is a, um, we go back to karma, a karmic issue between those souls. And we don't know, and we're not supposed to know. But if you let it drop, then you can go forward on your own path and not take up the path of the person who has been, uh, however, um, wrongfully eliminated. I guess that's a better word. I'm trying to be diplomatic about it. That's right. And, and, And to add to that, The guy could come after that and say, oh, yeah, that's what he was afraid of. He was afraid that the guy would come after her. That's what people don't consider when they're getting involved in these things. You, you want the answer for closure. You want to know, okay, who did it and why? And is there anything I can do? And a lot of times because of the whole scenario, when you're getting involved with somebody who will kill somebody else, it doesn't mean you're exempt. Exactly. And they don't want any trouble, and you're trouble. Yeah, you know. You, you have information that could be extremely, it's, it's dangerous. Once you identify yourself as someone who knows something, then you become a target. Exactly, and it happens all the time. One of the worst traumas to get through is the loss of a child. So when you deal with someone who has lost a young child, how do the children come through? 
the children come through in in giving them information that they might not have had, trying to appease any guilt they may have, and uh, just sending them everything they can think of to let them know that they didn't have any part in it. Because a parent always wants to protect their child. Mm -hmm. And you can't protect your child all the time, (laughs) if ever. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Really. (laughs) And so, yeah, it's, it's just the way it is. And so they come out and say, it just was an accident or it just happened this way and there was nothing you could do about it. And... And that's the way a child talks to the parent and tries to help them. I think the parent's getting help even before they come because they wait until they're ready for information. You can't come like the first week. Right, yeah. The grief is too intense. That's one thing. When you are in intense grief, the intuition element is sometimes backburnered or unavailable because the grief is so absolutely vivid on the you know front front and center you can't get around it and so when you finally have a chance to breathe then you have an opportunity to hear or sense or feel something that will be relieving i always say you get your best information while doing the dishes (laughs) water (laughs) you're doing nothing except concentrating on the water going over the plate the you know I don't know, just you're concentrating on nothing. Yeah. And all of a sudden things will come through. The other hard one is a pet, and the loss of a pet can be excruciating. And if you really want to teach your kids about death, you get a pet. When I give speeches to about my books or anywhere I go, I always have a little kid, a little girl usually come up and say, I just lost my pet. And I go, oh, fine. okay, have a seat. Mm-hmm. Because it is the hardest thing because that pet loves you unconditional. Never said a bad word to you. Gives you love. And then you lose them. It's really difficult. So, yeah, pets, pets to me are number. They're also the easiest to talk to. I love talking to the pets afterwards. What's the common message from them? That I'm here all the time, and I and I like my little toy, and I like the place I always lie down, and, and you know that kind of thing. Just messages like that, and then I tell them where the pet usually sat or slept or whatever, mm-hmm. just just to let them know that they're okay, and they're they're usually there with the person anyway. Which is really funny because, you know, that's a, a sensitive can pick up on that. And sometimes people will say, I felt whoever, the name, jump up on the bed last night. I didn't see anything, but that's exactly where the pet would be. Or I felt something rub up against my leg, and or I heard a meow or a, a bark, and there's nobody in my house, and there's there are signs. But we have to be quiet a lot of times in our mind to hear those things. Otherwise, we just drown it out with all, all of our daily drama. Yeah, that's where the dishes come in. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I like the shower. <laughs> the, the shower gets the head. <laughs> it's like, okay. <laughs> exactly. Just do something that's at a, you know, that you're concentrating on something else. And all of a sudden you go, wow, I haven't thought of that before. Yeah. Yeah. And that's it too. Again, going back to the surprise and the un, unexpected conversation that it just pops up and like, oh, that's not my language. Those aren't my words. And that's an idea that I can use. And I know someone is helping me. Exactly. Even automatic writing, I was drawing things. During the pandemic, I was drawing pictures of older, not older, but old time nurses, their hats and, and their the way they looked, and then I'd look it up online and say, yeah, there it is. So automatic writing does that too. It gives you information that you wouldn't have known before. That's why I like it so much. Actually, it, it's a very personal thing. You can get information from your spirit guides or from other just other entities all across the board, positive. And that's what people worry about. Well, am I going to draw in the bad thing? And it's like, well, well what are you thinking? <laughs> what, what are you thinking? Do you normally have bad thoughts? 
<laughs> what, you know, what's this about? Because it's the first the go to is, am I going to open a door to something that's negative and will harm me? And automatic writing, that's one of the first questions is, is this good for me? And well, you're just basically processing your own thoughts. And then something comes in that might be more intuitive and insightful. And it comes from a source and you can name that source whatever you want, but usually if it's for your highest good, it's a positive communication. And if it isn't positive, then shut it down. Yeah, absolutely. And I remember when I first started, I asked the same question, actually. Uh, and the answer was, people who are mean or terrible don't like me. <laughs> they don't want to be around like, who's caring and and want to and want to help they don't like it and then they said to me this is interesting would you want to be friends with a bank robber and okay the answer was no of course not no well they don't want to be with you either <laughs> they don't want to be your friend <laughs> no you're a mark there was another saying that, you know, you don't get any smarter just by dying. Cause that's where, you know, I want to ask all the dead people, how, how's it work and what should I do with my life? And it's like, no, 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 no. Just because they're deceased doesn't mean they've all of a sudden elevated in their consciousness. It just means they've transitioned to the next level of whatever it is their journey is on, you know, but that, I think that that's the other thing too, is you can't continue to consult all the deceased people hoping for, for magic and answers and inspiration and genius level. They're just going to tell you how, if they can, how to make a few right turns in life that will help hopefully help you in the spirit element as well by giving you some insight that's positive and life affirming. They don't want you to check out quick. It's interesting you should say that because just last month I was with this lady and she said, my husband died and I'm reading all these books. And what they said to me in the book was that the second you die, you know, everything, you know, the whole universe, you know, everything. And I'm going, that, that's not true. How could you know everything? And what is everything? I'm not sure what everything means. You know, there's a lot of everything out there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's a big category. Yeah, <laughs> it is. I mean, you have to put Bigfoot and aliens and all the little people and goblins and gremlins and ghosts they're all in there. And they don't all live in the same, not in the same wing, if even in the same universe dimension. So, yeah, that's everything. And then some. Everything. Yeah. It's it's really a weird concept to think we know everything. And what proves it for me is I talk to someone and I say, well, do you remember when we were kids and we did this and that? And they said no. And I said, oh, I thought you'd remember that. They, I said, now that you're there, look it up. It was fun. <laughs> now that you're Don't looking know up. everything. Go back in that card file. Well, the, there is a card file kind of books and stuff and you can look at anything up that you want even past lives. the akashic records yeah and then they look it up and they and if they want to and it's fun you know whatever i was talking about was fun so they would i'd say look it up you'll find it and you'll enjoy hearing about it but they didn't know in advance Part no, of that, we, with that experience, it's like you know everything and you know nothing. All of a sudden, you're a clean slate and everything is accessible and there aren't any worries, there aren't any fears. It's, it all melts and you become one in some form with all that is. And that's liberating. But that isn't necessarily a sign that you need to check out early because that's not, you're here, we are here for a purpose, each and every one of us. And some know what their purpose is, others don't, but we're here now. And this is the moment we have the ultimate power to learn and to grow and to evolve and to explore. And to miss that opportunity is to miss the point, I think. Yeah, and there's a lot of things we're supposed to learn, which makes it even more complicated. So much to learn. So there's different categories that you learn. And yeah, it's very complicated. Life is very complicated. And then in the end, you, you go to the other side and you can look it up and find out all the answers you want. I think when, when people are grieving, they are looking for some kind of affirmation, validation that it isn't over, that my spouse, my partner, my friend, my mother, my whoever it is that's super important is okay. And that they'll be okay, too. So, because that grief process is intense. I can't even go there. 
Yeah. It's the worst. So that's what happens is all of a sudden then all these books become available, but there hasn't been a groundwork or foundation laid ahead of time to be able to sort the wheat from the chaff. And so, you know, it's like all of a sudden you're getting an overwhelming abundance of information and there's no way to know which way is up. What I hear in saying when, when you die, you know everything, I hear someone looking for a release, looking for something that will help them alleviate their pain. And so that must be okay, that you, you know everything. And at the same time, going back and saying, remember, you're in grief, make good choices. Because that's a time of your life when you're going to make some decisions that could be hasty because of the intense pain. Yeah, I know. And people take advantage of you then. Uh-huh, yeah. Yeah, so just, you know, going back to, Dealing with a medium who can help you identify what's most important, what are you dealing with in the grief, and usually it's a connection and a reassurance from the person, the being, the entity that you were closely connected to who's no longer by your side. You can't feel them, you can't touch them, you can't see them, you can't hear them, you can't smell them. All those things that made them real are gone. That's a void. It's empty. It hurts. It's painful. And what a medium, a good medium, like the work you've been doing for 30 years, can help you do is reconnect to the life, the joy, the enthusiasm you had for being present and knowing that that other being is still with you in a different form. And the love, like you said, hasn't gone. It's, it, it's just, it's, boy, it's a hard jump to make when we're so connected and ingrained with the physical as being the only realm of reality. Yeah, that could be hard if you don't have that knowledge. Absolutely. I like the fact that when you're seeing people, you see them as fully physical. That's a gift. It's a talent. It's an ability that is is rare for us at this time. But I think as we expand and evolve our telepathic abilities, that's one of the influences and parts of this physical, this being, this vessel, that we just haven't gotten around to upgrading and approving yet because it's been so discouraged and taboo because it gives you power when you are able to tap into that information life gets i think a lot easier to navigate knowing okay i will live and i will die and i will go on and so does everybody else so if you can try not to make as many enemies on this side (laughs) so you have more friends on the other Yeah. Yeah. Well, they do have this thing that always tells me that, you know, you, you kind of do, you do understand why you went through a hardship after you pass. You do understand why you did that. Somehow right now, while you're going through it, that knowledge may help. It may not help. To me, the people I meet and myself included want what we want and we want it now. (laughs) <laughs> we don't want, I didn't want my mother to die. Yeah. I didn't want my father to die, you know, but that's life. That's just the way it is. And I think as we get older, we learn to accept that a little better. Or maybe with time we do, hopefully. We experience hardships for a reason. Yeah. And when we, when we pass on, we do understand that reason. And it does help us after we pass on. Sometimes with time it helps, but I think mostly the knowledge is what we're what we need. Just like you said, we need that knowledge so that we can continue. Well, it's like reading a book. I can get everything I know reading a book, but once I try to actually do this myself, then that's a whole different story because I may not have the talent for one thing to immediately go out and do what the book says I should be able to do. But through trial and error, I might be able to become proficient. And if I'm already in some way able to do that, if I have the aptitude for it, I may become talented. But those things are different when you're hearing and seeing somebody else's progress or their hurdles, and then you assume that, you know, walk a mile in my shoes. That's a whole different story. If you take a course in school, some of us can get A's and not really be 
interested in it that much and we go on with our lives and never use anything that we learned in the class and others we go in that class and we take it and we learn it and we use it and we do well with it some of us don't do as well with it I guess we're we're it's like if I would draw a picture of a horse you wouldn't know it was a horse I'd have to tell you but someone else who could draw (laughs) could make a horse look I can't do that. <laughs> I like that, yeah. Oh, uh, that looks like a stick pony. Okay, maybe it's a pony. Uh-huh. <laughs> I embellish. I embellish. What did you want me to see in this? Oh, yeah, a horse. Okay, good. Uh, maybe. <laughs> Which end? <laughs> I'm not sure to see a horse in mine, even if it was stick or legs. I don't know. <laughs> Well, I, it's, it helps to have somebody who has a track record of, of positive connections to be able to give you affirmation and validation that there's more to life than just the physical aspect. And when someone does die, it's not forever. There, there's, there's an element that they are with us, and eventually we will reconnect. Exactly. And that's the best thing you can learn in life. And to find a way to keep going because that's what they want you to do. People who pass on who are really your loved ones, all they want is for you to be happy. You know, they don't want to see you sad. So they come back, they try to help. And it it works, I think. Sometimes you want more help. (laughs) Sometimes you just want the person back and forget all the Yeah, yeah. I don't care about the help. Just come back, yeah. Well, Just come back. Right? Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. We can deal with whatever else. And the, the near death experiences, sometimes they've said, you know, I could have stayed, but there was, there was going to be more complications if I stayed than if, than if I, you know, continued. And, um, I had the choice and then they say, well, I knew there were going to be complications when I came back just because I needed to be here or you needed me or somebody needed me and I, I could get something done if I continued, even if it was going to be more complicated. I like those stories. Natalie Sudman, she's the one I was blown up, you know, in a, um, a roadside bomb, I think was what happened with that. But, but she, as she said, her spirit guides helped her piece her body back together and decided which parts that they would help her with and which parts she was going to have to do on her own once she came back. <laughs> <laughs> so she was kind of fun, you know, they were deciding who, who got what part to fix. And, um, but, but that was it. It was, she was going to come back, but there were going to be some hardships. And she continues to talk about her near death experience and is, is influential in, in ways, you know, that other people don't have the ability to, to speak about because of her experience. Can I give you a, another way of looking at it? Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, the way I, I get it, is uh, it's very complicated down here on Earth, and we're supposed to learn people uh, learn from different experiences. And the way I'm taught, and and this is just me, we don't have that choice. They make that choice for us. That's the way I was taught. You don't have that choice. We make that choice for you. And when, when I'm dealing with people who are dying, there are sometimes I can help them get their grounding back so that they can live. Sometimes I can't. And the, the times when I can't, I know in advance, I just lost a good friend. Believe me, I wanted to help her and keep her here. But when I went to ask about her, they said, there's nothing you can do except bring, give her comfort. And believe me, she did not want to go. She would have fought tooth and nail not to. And she didn't have a choice. They said, no, it's your time. I believe that. I believe there are, if if there's a higher purpose, we're not going to know about it for us to be gone, then it it will happen. I do think that sometimes there are extenuating circumstances where someone else, it isn't about you or your immediate others, but there's someone else down the pipeline that you have to come back for. And you don't want to come back because it's great. It's really good. It's wonderful where you're, where you're, what you're being shown and what you're seeing. It's like, oh, yeah, I can leave. I don't, it's everything there is too complicated. And they say, yeah, that's nice. We wanted to show you so you know at the end run you're okay, but go back and help that person. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> that's on your plate and you're not done until you do that. You know, and it may take another 20 exactly. years. So. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> yeah. Yes, exactly. And it may take another 30, 20 years, mm. 20, 30 years or whatever it may be. Yeah. 
And when you're, but when you're down here, and I call it down here, yeah. you're fighting every day to stay here. And you don't even know what is important and what isn't important until maybe after the fact. Maybe you met somebody and you said something to them. This happened to me the other day. Uh, I met someone and without realizing it, I had said things. And after I had said them, I said to myself, where did that come from? But we both know. And then she looked at me kind of funny. And then uh, I changed her perspective on, on a job she was trying to get. I think she's going to go for something else. But you don't realize that you could do that every day, everybody. A smile, a smile, you know, just saying something nice or, or you know, encouraging changes everything. Yeah, there, there's a lot here for us to connect with. And when we are able to find out about those who are deceased that we loved and find out that maybe there isn't an ending, there's more. Life goes on in a different form. Awareness, existence continues, but it takes a while to be able to get through the grief when you lose someone close. And when a medium is available, then that's an opportunity to connect some more dots and to, to get some kind of assurance that there is so much more to living and loving than we can, we can fathom. And that's why we're here. We don't know it all. Exactly. We can't know everything, but we wish we did. I think we wish we did. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, and, and it might be boring. <laughs> yeah, who wants? Let me say that. It might be boring, okay? <laughs> it might be. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want big surprises. That's little surprises are good, you know, but uh, but the boring part would would be just a little annoying. Yeah, I th- I think I like the the entertainment field here. Yeah. 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 What would you like to add? Is there anything? And you've got the two books, and Automatic Writing is the one that um, they're both available on Amazon. Phases of Life After Death, written in Automatic Writing, and the other one, Ghostly Guide to England, with the spirits that you encountered. Okay. Well, on a, on a the last note, the spirits. Was there one that stands out from your trip? Before I say that, I also have a third book, oh. and it's uh, How to Know If You Had a Psychic Experience. So that's also, if you put my name in, it'll come up. Okay. Irma Slage, S-L-A-G-E. My favorite um, spirit to talk to was Charles Dickens. He he was, you know, he had a tough life and he became a tough cookie. When I asked him questions, it was direct and I like direct. Mm -hmm. (laughs) He loved to speak. And I think we both like to speak, you and I. Mm -hmm. And I I just... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and I just thought that he was very, very interesting, even from the other side. Did he have any advice? No, he wasn't the type to give advice. He was more of the type to say what he was on his mind about, you know, writing. And I stood at his desk for a long time, as I said, and just the hardships of life. He went through all that, and that's what made him who he is or was. I think I was engrossed with how he came up with all his stories. It came from real life. And so, you know, it, most of our stories do come from real life. And yeah, I, I, I just thought he was an interesting character. I would go back to Buckingham Palace. A lot of ghosts? A lot. It, it was filled. Oh, gosh, the tower where all the people were beheaded. Anne Bolin. There was a lot in England because it's so old and they weren't exactly nice to the people. So you have a lot of bad stories. A lot of trauma. Yep. Yeah. And trauma brings. Yeah, like a moth to a flame. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, I want to go to your Facebook uh, page, Psychic Counselor, Irma Slage, Medium. And there's a face in the orb. This is in that mine we talked about earlier. The face in the orb. And this is in Virginia City. Actually, have them go to uh, Irma Slage. I don't write too much on that account, the psychic part. I just write a lot under Irma Slage, and and they'll get all the um, stories and pictures, and they can ask questions. Yeah. Okay. Well, and I appreciate you sharing your stories and, and talking about Charles Dickens. I would not have expected, but it makes sense. It makes, it makes sense that he still has a lot to say. 
oh, he still has a lot to say, and he's still a rough, tough guy. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate you having me on, too, Wendy. This was a lot of fun. Again, Irma Slage has three books. She's done TV, newspaper interviews, 30 years of experience. The thing is about this conversation, when I tried to edit and save it, it stopped recording, or the saved part was only 26 minutes. This interview is an hour. So I had to go back and figure out why I didn't save the entire interview. And of course, there's all sorts of, I'm sure, logical reasons. But the place where it stopped, I was referring to conscious dying. When someone stays longer to help those who are going to be traumatized, grief-stricken, and upset, they stay longer to help ease the transition. They may do it in spirit form, so they, they do check out in physical form, but remain in spirit form to help soften the blow and, you know, say goodbye or allow others to say goodbye. And my pets have done it visually for me to watch them. One dog said, I'm ready to go. Another one had a conversation, a cat had a conversation with a dog. And when I walked up as she was preparing to leave and they parted ways because I was overhearing a conversation that was private. A cat told me to leave because it was too difficult for him to transition with me basically hovering, watching the pot boil. He needed space. This is the kind of stuff that intuitives, some intuitives encounter. And conscious dying is a way of us transitioning with full knowing that we will see each other again. The person who's left in the physical will be, for a while, uncomfortable, traumatized, grief-stricken, but the love lives on. So that's what I was talking about. And so it cut off everything else after that. But that was a surprise. And apparently, because I've had several issues recently concerning living and dying and a death and a health issue and all that, that uh, prompted this little divine intervention. A reminder, we all have certain abilities that we can work on consciously. Transitioning is one. Links are in the description for the show. And like I said, I'll, I'll post on the blog, Conscious Living in Wendy's Coffee House, WordPress. I'll post some of Irma's photos, orb photos. And maybe you have a few of your own to share. Thanks for listening. Selling a little or a lot. Shopify helps you do your thing however you cha-ching. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. From the launch your online shop stage to the first real life store stage, all the way to do we just hit a million orders stage? Shopify's there to help you grow. Whether you're selling scented soap or offering outdoor outfits, Shopify helps you sell everywhere. From their all-in-one e-commerce platform to their in-person POS system, wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. Shopify helps you turn browsers into buyers with the internet's best converting checkout. 36% better on average compared to other leading commerce platforms. And sell more with less effort thanks to Shopify Magic, your AI-powered all-star. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the U.S. And Shopify is the global force behind Allbirds, Rothy's, and Brooklinen, and millions of other entrepreneurs of every size across 175 countries. Plus, Shopify's award-winning help is there to support your success every step of the way. Because businesses that grow, grow with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash audioboom, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash audioboom now to grow your business no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash audioboom. Major phone carriers make you sign contracts with rigid data plans to trap you into a kind of forced phonogamy. Sounds pretty insecure if you ask me. At Consumer Cellular, we believe in a more consensual and healthy form of phonogamy, free of contracts and more flexible to your data needs. This way, you stick around not because we force you to with contracts and fees, but because you love our phone plans. Like ardently love our phone plans. Phonogamously. Consumer Cellular. When Freedom calls, we're here to answer. Call us at 1-888-FREEDOM.